What is up, it's Mel. Welcome back to the channel. Thank you for stopping by. A friend of mine sent me this story this morning. She was like, Mel, I thought about you. You should read this. And it's this crazy situation that happened recently. This podcaster that was stalked by this guy for like eight months. But there's like more to the story. Apparently they had met. He was watching her podcast, became obsessed and killed the podcaster and the husband. And he climbed up a window and shot them. The mother, the podcaster's mother was in a house. She ran away and got away. The guy shot and killed himself. So we're going to talk about that. Make sure you check out my sponsor, Data Seal. Protect yourself from these crazy MFers online because these data broker websites are storing your information, like your phone number, addresses, your family's addresses, everything, all online. And even if you request to take it down, they'll put it right back up after a couple of weeks or months. So you have to keep the service. Your information is being sold by data brokers all the time. It's easy for anybody to look up your information using people search websites. They can find your home address, date of birth, email address, phone number. Dataseal.io is the data removal and monitoring service I trust to remove my information from the internet. Click the link below and use the code five off all to save five percent off your data seal subscription. All right, so let's start out with this article. Revealed Texas trucker 38 stalked married Seattle tech podcaster 33 for a months by parking outside her house, bombarding her with flowers, texts, and calls before breaking into her home to shoot her, her husband, then himself after she reported him. The Texas trucker stalker who killed the Seattle podcaster and her husband in their home last night after climbing through a window had been harassing her for 18 months. Chilling court records obtained by Daily Mail reveal. Zore, I hope I'm saying that right, Zore, Sadie Gee, 33, a self-styled techie, was shot and killed by trucker Raman. I'm just going to say Kodak. He's 38 years old. Last night in her home in Redmond, Washington, he climbed through a window at 2 a.m. and shot the pair then himself. Sadie Gee's mother was able to escape to a neighbor's home and call 911. Sadie Gee's husband, Mohammed, 35, who worked for a lead software engineer for Amazon, was also killed. Police say Kodak first found her through a podcast about finding work in tech and became so obsessed with her that she filed a restraining order against him. Kodak was divorced with a child, but had no prior criminal record. Court records obtained by Daily Mail describe how the pair met in person in 2022. So I really wonder, because it says here also that, and how Sadigi hid some of their interactions from her husband. What interactions exactly? I wonder what happened during this meeting. Was it just like a friendly meeting? Hey, thank you for your support, blah, blah, blah. Or was it more? Now, this is the killer, which I, I wonder some of his, what's his background? His, you know, no prior criminal history, but like uh, any mental health stuff, bruh. Stalking, bro, for months and months and months. Obsessed. This is the suburban home that uh, Sadigi and Muhammad were killed at. This was their home by the stalker, Raman Kodak. Really nice home. The interior of the home where a stalker broke in through a window last night and killed a husband and wife living inside. Damn. I wonder if they had any alarms because they have the, the alarm systems that also detect glass shatter, something like that, like a window being broken. It, it probably wouldn't help them though, maybe, I guess. Um, I mean, unless they had guns. And the alarm went off and maybe alerted them. And then if they had guns, maybe they could try to protect them. So I don't know if they were armed or not. This was the complaint filed March 2nd, 2023. Stalking. Okay. Telephone harassment. Damn. Court records obtained. Uh, this is the voicemail for Sadigi from December 5th, 2022. Okay. 2.40 p.m., 11 a.m. Morning time, evening times. 7 a.m., 5 a.m. The stalker's relentless calls and voicemails to the victim in February before she called police. Let's take a look at some of these dates together, important dates. And so, number one, verbally told Kodak to leave me alone, November 6, 2022. Verbally told him again to leave me alone, November 8, 2022. Number three, blocked the numbers I had. That was on November 10, 2022. Number four, blocked all the numbers and social media, November 13. 
2022. Wow. I continuously received messages from different numbers and accounts and had to keep blocking. Wow. So this guy's probably using one of those apps to get a bunch of different whatever numbers to try to reach out to her. Number six, Kodak sent a text message saying, Mr. Kodak wants to talk. I told Mr. Kodak, I can't talk. That was November 18th. Okay. Number seven, I told Mr. Kodak that I don't want to hear his voice or talk to Mr. Kodak through text. November 20th, 2022. Number eight, Mr. Kodak called me from an inn near my house. November 21st, 2022. Number nine, Mr. Kodak called me on a private number. I answered. And when I found out it was Mr. Kodak, I told Mr. Kodak not to call and leave me alone. Mr. Kodak told me he was in my neighborhood. I asked Mr. Kodak to go away. November 21st, 2022. Number 10, Mr. Kodak called on a private number again. I told Mr. Kodak to leave me alone. That was November 22nd, 2022. 2022. Number 11, I blocked all private numbers. Number 12, I blocked the number for voicemail from T-Mobile. Number 13, Mr. Kodak sent a text implying that Mr. Kodak was around my house through a Telegram app December 4th, 2022. This guy's doing everything. Number 14, Mr. Kodak sent a text message stating that Mr. Kodak was in my neighborhood through a Telegram app. That was December 8th now. Number 15, Mr. Kodak called from a nearby inn. That was December 2nd, 2022. Number 16, Mr. Kodak called from a nearby inn now on the 3rd, December 3rd. Number 17, I had surgery December 13th. And number 18, Mohammed left for Australia December 20th. Bro, I'd be, I don't know, I'd be worried to leave her back like that. Number 19, Mr. Kodak came to my door and brought flowers a few minutes after Muhammad left. So he's been watching the entire time after he left for Australia. Wow. Number 20, I called the police. That was December 20th, 2022, the same day with the flowers. Number 21, Mr. Kodak sent me jewelry, was delivered on the 3rd, January 3rd, 2023. Not sure the exact date because I couldn't walk to check mail sometime between January 2nd and 5th. So Julie was delivered on the 3rd. Not sure the exact date. Okay. 22. I called the police. Mr. Kodak was given a warning by the police. January 16th, 2023. Number 23. Mr. Kodak called from a hotel in Nevada. January 22nd, 2023. Number 24. Mr. Kodak sent me a neck scarf. Picked it up on February 20th, 2023 from FedEx. Number 25, police officers took the next scarf as evidence on February 21st, 2023. The gift was open with police present. Interesting, dude. That's the friendship turned sinister and resulted in her begging him to leave her alone. Hauntingly, in a petition filed just last month, she pleaded he has bursts of anger and is completely delusional. These delusions make me fear for my life and the lives of my loved ones. She told police how he'd shown up at her home uninvited, delivering flowers, and even once promising to send a musical band to play outside. This kind of makes me think of that lady from Koberger that was obsessed and still is obsessed with him. She, why doesn't she have a guy like this? Encounter it, only now he's dead. These people could fill in each other's craziness, stockiness, obsessionness, you know, like she would probably find this kind of guy attractive. Wow. He contacted my husband and continues to do so. He has come to my neighborhood several times, staying at inns around my neighborhood. He has parked down my street in hopes of seeing me. I'm suffering a deep seated fear for my safety, she said. She included call logs, which demonstrates how frequently he phoned her and left messages and told police that he would sometimes park down the street in the hope of catching a glimpse of her. Disturbingly, he would stay at local inns near the property. Truck believed to belong to the killer stalker removed from the scene. These are some of the, this was the truck we just watched being taken away. 
the crime scene Friday morning. Crime scene. Both Zore and her husband were shot dead. Oh, it was a, a handgun, yeah. The stalker then shot himself in the chest using a handgun. I mean, that's so creepy. And then somebody just... I mean, if that's the truck he used, that truck stands out. I don't know. I mean, that's just so unfortunate and crazy. And my friend was warning me. She was like, yo, just like, be careful, man. Like with this online stuff, because dude, you see how some of these, some of the weird, crazy situations I've already encountered online or that I've had to deal with and, or even look like at Buster, right? I always, I feel like these people that stalk, that have that kind of time to stalk, there's gotta be some sort of mental illness. You see these people stalking, stalking Buster too. I mean, who has that kind of time to just stand out there just like hours and wait? And like, was it New York Post too that like they were waiting for a glimpse to catch a still image between the curtain, like between the little divider curtain things, a little space, a glimpse and a capture to capture him walking by. Fucking weird. At 2 a.m. last night, the trucker broke into the home and Redmond Washington shot her and her husband before turning the gun on himself. The woman's mother escaped and called 911. It's unclear whether he was in the area or if he drove from Texas to Washington to attack her. She had recently reported him to police. At 2 a.m. on Friday, he broke into her home on a leafy street in Redmond near Seattle to shoot her and her 35-year-old husband with a handgun. Redmond police could not confirm whether the stalker had a criminal background or whether he legally obtained his weapon. They say the man started turning. They say the man started tuning into her podcast several months ago, but started barraging her with messages. She had contacted police and authorities were preparing to serve him with a restraining order, but were having trouble pinning him down. Okay, Redmond. This was the official post from police that happened March 10th. Just going really basic over the details that we just spoke about. And real quick, too, um, I thought this was interesting. So there, there was a neighbor, Jamie Lynn Burns, a woman who was set to move into the house across the street from Sadigi and Asiri, was stunned by the murders. She said she visited the house just a week and a half ago and saw Sadigi's mother watching diligently out a window. I wonder now if she was maybe, you know, like on high alert, she told the Daily Beast. Burns called it shocking that something like this would happen in Redmond and said the couple had welcomed her to the neighborhood with open arms. They were just so friendly and inviting, Burns said. We were like, oh my gosh, we couldn't have found better neighbors. Now, this here too, I thought it was interesting and this is something that I've always talked about. I've had to get a restraining order in the past. Well, uh, Redmond's police chief is not mincing words. He calls a protective order or restraining order simply a piece of paper. And this evening, a community that rarely deals with murder is dealing with three dead people. Mohammed Milad Nasiri and his wife, Zore Sadigi, were murdered early Friday morning inside their Redmond home. This man, their alleged killer, 37-year-old, Ramin Hodet Karam Rezaei, was a man known to Redmond police and a source of both insomnia and anxiety for Zore Sadegi. This is every uh, victim, every detective, every police chief's worst nightmare. According to court records, Sadegi and her alleged murderer met on a social media app based around professional development, where Sadegi hosted a podcast. She claims he developed an obsession, sending her gifts and calling her nonstop, as many as a hundred times in a day. In January, records show she filed for a protection order, but police say that order wasn't served because the accused stalker was a long haul driver from Texas. That's the thing too, it's tough when you're trying to find or trying to serve somebody a restraining order and you don't know where they're at or they're moving from different location to location or whatever and you can't serve them. The way I had mine done was that the person showed up at my place again one morning and I pretended like, oh yeah, even though I didn't want them there, I was like, yeah, I'll be there at the door, just wait, I'm in the shower. I called the police, police came, caught them there, served them up right there in person. Now, the thing that the police chief was saying, and it's so true that these, these restraining orders, they they really are just a piece of paper. Like they don't do like nothing really. Like it's, 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 I guess what I read in the article, it's 
Some people feel a, a false sense of comfort when they do this. It's important to do it for legal reasons. Who knows what could happen in the future? Also, if you got to shoot and kill somebody, you'd be like, hey, I have a paper documentation of this psychopath stalking, harassing me in a fear for my life. So I shoot and kill this mother effort. Hey, I'm all good. It's right here documented. I've covered myself, even though, you know, even if she didn't do it, this situation, she'd still be good. But, you know, setting documentation too, because God forbid something happens to you, maybe you can't defend yourself. Now everything's documented and you can show this, this history. So it's important to do that. But like they're saying, it, it can, you don't want to get comfortable with just doing that. You know. Authorities couldn't find him. This was an individual uh, who, by virtue of his profession, uh, moved from place to place. Friday morning, police say Hodak Karam Rezaei broke into Sadegi's Redmond home and killed the couple. Redmond's police chief with a sober warning. I do not want to create a false sense of security just because a restraining order or a protective order is obtained that that is uh, you know, some type of shield. Seattle U professor Deirdre Bowen echoing this concern. You, the survivor, knows the abuser best. You want to think about how are they likely to respond upon receipt of the protection order. But the single most important thing that needs to be done is develop a safety plan. Calls this a worst case scenario. If you have a crazy stalker story, comment down below, share it with us. Uh, I will be back here later today, 7 p.m. Eastern for the fun stream I was talking about. I was supposed to do it yesterday. I postponed it to today. I just wanted to give myself some more time. I will be doing a little bit of prep. We're just going to hang out, have some fun, watch some funny videos, and we're going to do a giveaway. Make sure you download the Swagit app, click the link, download the app, follow me on there to, for a chance to win. And um, yeah, I'll see you guys later. Peace. Bloop, bloop.